भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगयस्तुष्टुवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नाक्षो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 So today we'll do the seventh mantra, and here we are. You are, you have reached it, the climax. Hmm. It's the smallest of the Upanishads, twelve uh, uh, mantras only, and in the in these twelve mantras, the most important one is the seventh mantra, which we are going to do now. Um, in fact, in all of Upanishadic literature, probably the seventh mantra of the Mandukya Upanishad is the most important. and that's what we're going to study today in fact in this very in this text what follows after this seventh mantra the other mantras and the karikas they are they will discuss you remember omkara vichara and analysis of the om om and uh, uh, then what will follow is after afterwards three more chapters three more chapters This is the first chapter, you know, Mandukya Karika has four chapters. So three more chapters are basically discussion of um, this mantra. And there, it's basically the discussion of the teaching given in this mantra. So this is really the the high point uh, of the Mandukya Karika and of Vedanta, I would say, Advaita Vedanta. Let's chant the mantra together, seventh mantra, and then we will discuss it. नात प्रज्ञ ओके आई चैंट एंड यू फॉलो मी नात प्रज्ञ न बहिष्प्रज्ञ नो भयत प्रज्ञ न प्रज्ञानघन न प्रज्ञ न प्रज्ञ अदृष्ट अव्यवहार्यम अग्राह्यम अलक्षण अचित अव्यपदेश्यम एकात्म प्रत्ययसारम प्रपंचोपशम शात शिवम्द्वैत चतुर्थ मे स आत्मा सविज्ञेय सो द टीचिंग इज आई जस्ट क्विकली ट्रांसलेट एंड देन वी विल गो इन टू द डिस्कशन दे कंसिडर द फोर्थ टू बी दैट विच इज नॉट कॉन्शियस ऑफ द इंटरनल वर्ल्ड नॉट कॉन्शियस ऑफ द एक्सटर्नल वर्ल्ड नॉट कॉन्शियस ऑफ बोथ द वर्ल्ड नॉट अ मैस ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस नॉट कॉन्शियस नॉट Okay, not conscious, not unconscious. It's not a very nice translation. Anyway, not unconscious, which is unseen beyond empirical dealings, beyond the grasp of the organs of action, uninferable, unthinkable, indescribable, whose valid proof consists in the single belief in the self. Again, not a nice translation. Anyway, I'll tell and tell you about it, in which all phenomena cease. and which is unchanging auspicious and non dual that is the self and that is to be known all right let's take a look at what we have here by the way each time i draw a diagram but remember it's it looks different but it's basically the same thing that i'm trying to tell you in when i draw it a little differently
what I'd like to do is, before we go into a discussion of the seventh mantra, to lead into the discussion, we need to know a few things, which I will present in the form of eight points, no less. The first point is um, a simply a look at where we are right now before we go into this, a, re, a recap, a review, if you will. So the, it, this diagram, I will present what, what have we got so far? What has the uh, Mandukya Upanishad told us so far? Mandukya Upanishad, you know, it, it be, begins with two kinds of inquiries. An inquiry into the self, Atma Vichara. An inquiry into Om. And first the inquiry into the se self is taken up, which is, which is what we are doing now. What was the inquiry into the self? It started off in this way. The self has four aspects, Chatushpad, Atma. Three of the aspects they have discussed. The first aspect is the waking, the self, um, in its, what is called the gross aspect, is, uh, let's put it this way, aspect. And knower known. And state. So the first statement, the self has four aspects. And the rest of the Upanishad is the discussion of the four aspects of the self. By knowing this, we are supposed to get the liberating knowledge. Now, the first aspect is the, the in, in Sanskrit, sthula, which means gross. The gross. What do you mean gross? Is this physical world. When you, the self, you appear clothed in a body, experiencing a physical world through the senses. The consciousness is directed outward through the senses. We see things outside, we hear things, external sounds, we uh, smell and touch and taste and think about the world. So this is, your, your in, you are inhabiting an external world, a physical world, experienced through the senses. And... Then the second aspect was the sukshma, the subtle. Where is the self in its subtle aspect? You know now, in dreams. Remember, all this analysis is taking place in which, which uh, state? In the waking state. From this point of view, today, right now, you're sitting here in the chair, in this uh, uh, waking state and reading the book and thinking about all of this. So when you think back to your dreams, uh, what, what, how would you describe your dreams? Well, you would say it was all in the mind. You would say it's all in the mind, right? I was sleeping, it seemed real at that time, but now I know it's not real, it's not physical, it was something imagined in the mind. Uh, that's called a dream. And I was there too. I, or I the self, you, you were there in your dream definitely. And that's called a subtle aspect of the self because it was all mind. And then there is one more aspect in Sanskrit, Karanatma, which is causal. Where is this found? This is found in deep sleep. Why is this called causal? Because they have a different way of looking at deep sleep. Can you imagine deep sleep as the cause, as the cause means source, source, as the cause of the subtle and the gross because if you look at it from that point of view, everything seems to come out of deep sleep. In the darkness of deep sleep, nothing is distinguishable. Then you have dreams and waking, and then you go back to sleep again. And so everything seems to be arising from that. From that point of view, the deep sleep is called the causal. Another reason why the deep sleep is called the causal is because all these differences in the waking state, all the things that you see in dreams, all of them are as if merged into a blankness, into a mass of nothingness. It's all covered in darkness, in deep sleep. So all differences are resolved, merged in deep sleep state. Now, one way of looking at cause, the material out of which things are found is, the effects are usually merged back in the cause. Where do the waves go? Is it to the shore? Not quite. They go back into the water they have come from. Where does, uh, where, um, 
you know, when the parts are destroyed, they go back to the earth. It's not literally true, you know. Once you've made a pot, it doesn't quite go back to the earth. In fact, one of the most long-lasting things that human beings have ever made in, in history are parts. Because what do you find when they excavate <laughs> ancient sites? Parts. They haven't quite gone back to the earth. Anyway. <laughs> Why say, I'm saying this is, in India, a few years ago, we had a railway minister. So one of the ideas, brilliant ideas, uh, was that uh, to prevent people from littering the countryside with tea cups and coffee cups and all of that, you know, it made of plastic or paper, and people just drink and throw it away instead of putting it in the trash. And so the whole, uh, sometimes by the sides of the railway lines, you'll find litter. So instead of doing that, let's have only earthen cups, which are very popular in India, made of clay, clay pots for tea. So if you, even if you throw it away, it will go back to the earth, except that it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look as bad as if it were if paper cups or plastic cups, but still they will not merge back into the earth. Anyhow, but the idea is effects go back to their causes. So in one sense, it looks like the waking world or the dream world from your subjective experience has gone back into the darkness of deep sleep. So that's, you can call it the causal state or causal aspect of the self. The self has, so th these are the three aspects. The gross, stula, the subtle, sukshma, the causal, karana aspects. And the fourth one is the self itself, which is consciousness. So it is the self, your real self, which appears with a gross name and form, with subtle names and forms, with all names and forms merged. These are the three ways in which you experience the self. In each, you will find there is a knower and a known, a pair, a subject and an object, an individual and a totality. Here, um, the knower and the known in Sanskrit, pramata prameya. So, in the, in the gross aspect, you will find the knower and the known. Who, are, who is the knower here? We'll call him the waker. Him or her? The waker. And what is the known here? The waking universe. Remember, one good way of learning Vedanta is to come, always check it off against your, your experience. They will just narrate what you experience. Sometimes it may seem a little strange because they are narrating it in a different way, giving a more a different way of explaining it. But they are not talking about anything out of our experience. They are not talking about anything that you have to believe, take it on faith. No, generally not. So the waker and the waking universe. Here I am, the knower of the waking state. I, and here is my knowable, the waking universe. And where is this found? In what state? In the waking state. In Sanskrit, Jagrat Avastha. State means Avastha. Known and known Sanskrit will be Pramata Prameya. Aspect is Pada. Pada means four Padas, four, four aspects. So in the waking state, you will find yourself associated with a physical body, experiencing a physical reality through sense organs and you are the waker, um, in Sanskrit, the Vishwa. And the waking universe, in Sanskrit, Jagrat Prapancha. Or Jagat, Jagrat Prapancha. Okay, so far. And where did we find this? In which mantra? Mantra number uh, 3. Mantra number 3. Jagarita Sthano Bahish Pragya. The waking, the, the waking state where the consciousness is externalized. It's a description of this. This line has just summarized mantra number three. The third mantra. Then the subtle aspect of the self. There there is a knower and a known universe. You are in the subtle aspect you are the dreamer. Dreamer means... Not the person who is lying down in bed and dreaming, but the person in the dream. You are in your own dream. Hmm? The person, the boy or the girl who is dreaming, you are in the, your, own, your own dream. That's the person. Dreamer. 
and that dreamer experiences a dream universe a dream universe a dream universe and where is this found where do you find these things in the in the dreaming state in the dream state and where where where, where have we taken this information from this is from the fourth mantra mantra 4 sapna sthan anta pragya that mantra which describes the dream state what is basically the dream state the dream state is where you are having lots of experiences you are there and there is a world which you are experiencing people and events keep happening in that and the whole state is called the dream state and um, up from which you wake up later on this whole thing you the dreamer and the dream universe together is called the subtle aspect of the self notice one thing we normally think of the self as i am the self and this is not the self i am the self i am the subject this is the object this is not me i not i but look at what the upanishad has done very interestingly from the very beginning itself it says the i and the not i both all together are in the experience of the self in the waking state it basically from the upanishad's point of view even before you go to the fourth here itself right now itself it recommends looking at this entire universe as yourself this recommends it highly recommended that i am this is the knower and this is the knowable universe and both are appearing in one awareness which is me and that is the gross aspect of the self subtle aspect of the self and similarly the causal aspect of the self where you are the sleeper <coughs> and instead of saying sleep universe it's you can say sleep universe for the sake of symmetry but it's not a universe it's everything is merged let's call it the merged universe if you say what what do you mean the merged universe i don't see any kind of merged universe in deep sleep what do you see in deep sleep blankness darkness hmm? no differentiation come 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 sit no differentiation at all that's what uh, the upanishad looks at it in that way imagine this room i've given this example earlier imagine this room suddenly plunged into darkness all light switched off curtains drawn and you can't see anything or instead of all that trouble just close your eyes so you can't see anything and it means all the differences are there but they're shrouded in darkness in the same way in deep sleep all the differences are merged sort of Dif- what differences the different things that you saw in the waking universe and the different things that you saw in your dreams it's like they are there baby but you can't experience any of it they are all merged in ignorance it's basically the way we d- we ha- have deep sleep it's a new way of describing it so it's the merged universe let's say or the resolved universe or the uh, all differences erased temporarily and where do you find such an experience in deep sleep in deep sleep which mantra talked about this mantras 5 and 6 5 and 6 now see what we have we have got so far we have got this very self the self is supposed to have four aspects and the four aspects are spoken about in the gross aspect subtle aspect causal aspect stula sukshma karana atma and the atma itself is supposed to be the fourth aspect which we shall talk we have not talked about it yet the mantras 4 uh, 3 4 5 and 6 spoke about this what did they tell us the waker vishwa experiences the universe jagat world what you are experiencing through five senses and it's available in the waking state jagrat avastha the dreamer experiences a dream world which is of course a creation in the mind of the waker i mean when uh, that guy goes to sleep the guy dreams of the whole world but still in the dream itself you are an individual and you have a world which you experience and that is available in what which state dream swapna avastha what are you called there in sanskrit uh, taijasa 
and this dream world is Swapna Prapancha, dream world. Karana, the causal self is experienced in deep sleep, Sushupti Avastha. And there also you have two, though it does not seem to be two. Because you don't have a mind to distinguish or think about it. So only when you wake up, you say, I slept. And what did you experience? What kind of universe? Not a waking universe, not a dream universe. A kind of merged universe. Everything, all differences resolved. So, and that we talked about in the fifth and sixth mantras. Now we are ready to go into the seventh mantra which will talk about the fourth aspect of the self. Don't get confused. Seventh mantra, fourth aspect. Four aspects of the self. Chatushpal Atma. One, two, three and four. All right. Here is the point I want to make. Point. I said eight points. I'm going to make eight points. Here's the first, the, after all of, all of this, the point I'm going to make, this is the first point, the recapitulation of what we did. Now the second point I want to make. What is special about this seventh mantra, about the fourth aspect of the self? Remember why we are doing all of this. To get self-knowledge. What good is self-knowledge? To get that self-knowledge which will lead to liberation. What do you mean by liberation? Liberation from suffering. Attainment of bliss. That's the, that's the selling point of Advaita Vedanta, of, uh, of spirituality. It will take you beyond suffering. It liberates you from samsara. So this... Knowledge is supposed to come from the analysis of the self. The Upanishad says, by self-knowledge you will get it. Atma Jnana, self-knowledge. Now the point I want to make, point number two is this. When the Upanishad says self-knowledge, it means knowledge of the fourth aspect. It does not mean what we have done so far. Huh. You might think, oh, we've been wasting our time so far. Why didn't you get down straight to it? If I went down straight to it, if I started off by saying neither waking nor sleeping, nor deep sleep, beyond thought, beyond language, pure consciousness, you say, what are you talking about? Now when I say it, it will make sense in contrast to what we know. You see, these are all aspects of the self and Upanishad just pointed these out. This is not the teaching of the Upanishad. The Vedanta teaching of the Upanishad has not started yet. It's going to start today. What was all this? You, don't, you know all this. It was just you, you, what you, we all experience. Do we not wake? We are awake, hopefully. Do we not dream? We do. Do we not sleep? We do. It was just a narration of how we have experienced life till now. And it says how you have experienced life till now can be broadly described in three ways, three aspects. None of which is going to liberate you. Why not? Well, you have been experiencing it till now. You know it. Has it liberated you? No. Being the waker has not liberated you. Being the, the dreamer has not, dreaming has not liberated. And sleeping certainly has not liberated you. You are not enlightened yet. How many times have you woken and dreamt and slept? Thousands and thousands of times. Not yet. And yet once you understand, grasp this, they say, Sakrit, in a flash, you are liberated from samsara. Liberation from samsara means liberation from the waking, dreaming, deep sleep universes. Though you will only be in that, but you will be free of it. You will not suffer anymore. You will attain the bliss that is promised in Vedanta. And that is attained by knowledge of the fourth aspect, which is now going to be talked about. So now we have a deeper, clearer understanding of what is meant by self-knowledge in the Upanishads. Self-knowledge in the Upanishads is not what, you know, kids here they say, I'm dropping out of college. Why? To the aghast, to the looks of parents, I'm going to discover myself. That, not that kind of self-knowledge. Yeah. I'm going on a backpacking trip to the Himalayas or something to discover. Not that kind of self-knowledge. Or I'm going to give up my um, medicine degree to paint or play the guitar. Not that kind of self-knowledge. This self-knowledge is the one which, the fourth aspect of the self which underlies the, the three. The three that we know. So the liberating knowledge of the self is the seventh mantra. Which we are now ready to investigate, ready to receive. That's point number three. Two. Point number two of what? A segue into the seventh mantra. Point number three. 
um, is I would like to correct possibly what might be called a fatal error. A lot of people make it. A deep misconception which even people who should know better in Vedanta, who have been studying, they make it. And there is a, um, it has come into usage also, certain terms which are meaningless. You see, the nature of the error is this. I'm warning you in advance so that we don't fall into that particular error. The nature of the error is this. Let me introduce a term first, Turiya. I've always been calling it the C, the big C, consciousness. This Today I will call it the Turiyam. Why? Because this is the word actually commonly used for the self in the real self, in the Mandukya. And it's a well-known term in Vedanta. Turiyananda, Swami Turiyananda, Turiyam. Turiyam, what does it mean? It means nothing other than four. It just means the fourth. Literally, Turiyam means the fourth. It's not a term that the Upanishad itself uses. The Upanishad uses the term Chaturtham, which means fourth. But Gaudapada introduces Turiyam, and which has become popular. So Turiyam, the fourth, the real self. What does it mean? The fourth aspect. Why should I care whether it's fourth or fifth or sixth or whatever? It's the real self. It's the real you. It's the answer to the question, what am I? So this Turiyam, we, we are trying to know that, realize what it is. Before that, let me give you an example. Um, it just occurred to me yesterday. It was cloudy. And we looked at the sun. sun. Sun barely peeped out in the afternoon. And it was small and milky and pale. Right. And I thought, that's not really the sun. You know, it's just my perspective. Um, it's covered by clouds. And I am millions and millions of miles away. So the distance and the perspective and the clouds and the atmosphere, they all make the sun look like that. It's not really what the sun looks like. Even now, it's bright daylight. When you go out, what do you see? The sun is about a bright ball of light about this big. Hmm? About this big. But is that what the sun really is? No, not really. If you go to the sun, the sun from its own perspective is a vast ball of nuclear fire. It's nuclear fusion going on for millions and millions of years. Tremendously powerful. That just an aside. Um, Stephen Hawking passed away. Yeah, you all know that. Yes. Uh, so the sun in itself is quite different from the way we see it, even on a bright day. Quite different from the way you see it on a cloudy um, day. And at night, and at night, how do you see the sun? You see, you don't. It's dark. But what is the sun then? Has the sun gone dark really? From its own perspective, it's exactly the same. So whether you see it as a bright ball of fire this big or whether you see it as a tiny pale disc or whether you don't see it at night. Do you see where I'm leading with this? Bright ball of fire here. Pale, smoky uh, disc here. Don't see it at all here. In all three cases, the sun is exactly the same. A vast mass of new, tremendous brilliance burning bright for millions and billions of years in nuclear fusion. So that's what the sun is. That's what you are, whether in waking, dreaming or deep sleep, no matter uh, how different it seems. Come, come. Yeah, there's a place here. That's just an example. Now, what is, the, what is the misconception? What I'm going to tell you now is not correct, but it's many people think that. They think that... Look, where do you find the waker, the first aspect of the self? In which state? Waking state. The first aspect is found in the waking state, the waker, Vishwa, in the waker, in waking state, right now. Where do you find yourself as Taijasa, the dreamer? Dream state, the second state. Where do you find yourself as the deep sleeper? Only after waking up, you think about it. So where were you sleeping? What state? Deep sleep state, pra, uh, pragya, the Sanskrit word for the deep sleeper. And hence, since the first aspect is available in the waking state, and the second aspect is available in the uh, second state, uh, dream state, the third aspect is available in deep sleep, sleep state, jagratavastha, swapnavastha, 
Sushupti Avastha. Therefore, it follows the fourth aspect should be available in a fourth state. Let's call it the Turiya Avastha. So, Turiyam should be available in the Turiya Avastha. No. That's a wrong idea. That's the wrong idea. Take the sun example that I gave you. When in the daytime you see a small brilliant ball of fire. At that time what is the sun? Is it like that or this vast? The vast thing which is the sun. When you see a milky sun covered by clouds, small. At that time has the sun changed? No. At night when we don't, from our perspective, when we don't see the sun at all, has the sun become dark? No. So, whatever condition, the sun is the same. In the same way, it's like saying, you know, uh, that, um, come, come. It's like saying that gold, the example I'll give you a little later, gold which is found in a golden bracelet, in a golden necklace, and in a golden ring, suppose. Three kinds of ornaments. So, uh, you f- w- w- the bracelet is one form, the uh, necklace is another form, and the ring is another form. And if somebody comes and tells you, now the fourth aspect is gold. Now, if you start looking for one more ornament called gold, you will miss it. You, you, will, you, are, you are mistaken. Right? Somebody told you there is a necklace, there is a bangle, um, um, or a bracelet, and a ring. And there is something called, real called gold. Where would you look for that gold? You would look in those very ornaments to find the gold. You would not look for a new ornament called a gold. Called gold. You will never find such a thing. In the same way, when you are told that there is a fourth aspect, Turiyam. Immediate thing is, and a lot of people have made this mistake, is that there must be a fourth state. It's like thinking that gold is a new ornament. Gold is not a new ornament. It's the reality of the three ornaments which were presented to you. The Turiyam is not a new aspect. It is the reality of the three aspects which we continuously experience. Is that part clear? The consequences of this error, you will not make the error anymore. in general, the error is not, not a serious problem. But when you want to understand Mandukya Upanishad, when you want to understand the essence of the teachings of Vedanta, it can be a serious stumbling block. Why is it a serious stumbling block? The moment you think that there is a fourth state where the Turiyam is available. Fourth state. And they have even invented a term, Turiya Avastha, the, the, the fourth state. When you think like that, and people write about it also. And sometimes in the scriptures also you find, in some texts, later texts, you find um, Turiya Avastha. Remember, there there's a reason why they have said that. I'll mention it later. But first, let's deal with the fatal error. The moment you think that there is a Turiya Avastha, the serious problem will be, if waker is available in waking, dreamer is in dream, sleeper in deep sleep, the Turiya will be available in Turiya state, fourth state, which means Turiya is not available now, not available in dream, not available in deep sleep, right? Most seriously, Turiya is not available now. In the waking, where are we doing Vedanta? In the waking. Hence, they will say that, okay, now you have got this idea, you have to go into the fourth state, which is a separate state, and find the real self, the Turiya. And then they will go further to link it to that state is the nirvikalpa samadhi. It will not help to sit in class in the Vedanta society with your books open, eyes open. No, you have to close your eyes, not fall asleep, not dream, but go into a deep meditative state called the fourth state. Some people are nodding. No, don't nod. This is, this is wrong. What I'm saying is wrong. It's, it's a nice selling point. It's available at the fourth state. That you will attain through esoteric meditation practices and then you will be realized, no, no, no. You have forever shut the doors to enlightenment. The door to enlightenment is where? Here, here, here. But in, the, in all three, in the waking, dreaming and deep sleep, in all states. But specifically in the waking. Why in the waking? Because here your faculties are fully active. 
and your intellect is fully active, your faculty of understanding is fully active, any kind of analysis, thinking, meditation, whatever you want to do, you have to do it here. So the doorway to enlightenment is in this first state and in all the three states. You don't have to look for a separate state. This is the nature of the error. Uh, don't think about a separate state. I'll come to you. Having thought about a separate state, having linked it to various kinds of um, ecstatic states, samadhis. Uh, so, so they say that now you have read about it in Mandukya class, now you should chase those, try to develop those. Remember, Vedanta is not against trances. Vedanta is not against samadhis. Vedanta is not against visions, extraordinary states of um, awareness. Vedanta is not against that. What Vedanta is saying that, that though that is not necessary for realizing Turiyam. If you have ordinary states like waking, dreaming and sleeping, Turiyam is the light behind all of them. And if you have extraordinary states, Vedanta says perfectly possible. You cultivate a certain kind of yoga. Why? You cultivate bhakti, intense bhakti. Love Krishna like Meera, you will get a vision of Krishna. What Vedanta says is, that is also Turiyam. Even that experience is lit up by Turiyam. See, those are experiences that is not the ultimate reality. What is the proof? They come and go. The vision of Krishna, which Meera had, is it there right now? For you? No. Is Turiyam there right now? Yes. Was it there earlier before you came to Vedanta class? Yes. Will it be there if you come to know, if you, um, I mean, make no further progress in Vedanta uh, after this with Turiyam, would you still be that Turiyam? Of course. Makes no difference. It's always there. Yes. Can you be enlightened in a dream? Technically possible. But then what is the, you, you have to ask yourself, what is the barrier to realizing myself as the fourth state, uh, as the fourth aspect of the self? You see, right now, what do we think of ourselves? As the first aspect, waker. That's what we think of ourselves right now. Most people think about, about themselves as this one. Now, how, why are we unable to realize ourselves as the fourth? The answer given in Vedanta is because of ignorance. Ajnana. We are not aware of it, we do not understand it, we do not grasp it, we, we are unable to um, shift our paradigm, our worldview that, to that, that point. Now how do you shift it? All ignorance is removed by knowledge. knowledge. Ignorance about the self will be removed by knowledge. self-knowledge. Right? So self-knowledge comes from where? Are you following me step by step? Self-knowledge comes from where? From, from using the intellect to grasp the teachings of the Upanishad, which guides you step by step to self-knowledge. Right? And where is that possible? How can, in Vedanta society. So how can you come to the Vedanta society? Usually in the waking state. You need that knowledge to be transmitted. The teacher transmits that knowledge from the text to you. Right? If you're in a dream, what would happen? In a dream, basically, it's this mind itself which is generating a world. So any teaching that you would get in the dream would be teaching by your own mind. If the mind already possessed that knowledge, then you would already be enlightened in the waking state. So ignorant mind conjuring a dream and giving teachings to you in a dream, the, the mind itself conjures up a guru and a disciple, both of which you, it's the same mind. Now, ignorant mind conjures up an, an enlightened guru or ignorant guru? Ignorant guru. It will not give you a, a knowledge at that time. That knowledge has to come in the waking state. It has to come from the Upanishads transmitted by a teacher in the waking state. And you make a breakthrough in the waking state. Afterwards, you can apply as much meditation you need to assimilate that knowledge. But it is true that even in the dream state, that knowledge will ultimately manifest. Having said this, let me... Add one more thing. Is spiritual progress possible in the dream state? It is possible in some sense because you hear of people getting mantra diksha in the dream. So many stories are there. Mantra diksha in the dream state, initiation into a mantra, visions of gods and goddesses, a vision of your spiritual master whom you will maybe meet later on in life. You get it in dream state. So those are possible. 
But here we are talking of something uh, far beyond religion also, I think. It's uh, uh, beyond that. Only whose preliminaries you find in conventional religion. Gurus and mantras and uh, um, forms of God and beliefs and meditation practices. All of that is preliminary to this. This is the f f conclusion, the, the, the peak of the Everest. So that was point number three. That um, um, the correction of a possible error. I've corrected it before it happened. So don't speak about Turiya Avastha and going into this ecstasy or that trance. Not relevant here. Nowhere the Upanishad speaks about Turiya Avastha. The Upanishad speaks about waking state, dream state, deep sleep state. It never speaks about Turiya state. No. It just speaks about the fourth aspect of yourself, which is the real aspect. Let me introduce you to... Um, the fifth point, which is just an example. I've used this example many times. Golden bracelet, golden necklace, golden ring. Golden bracelet, like the waking experience. Golden um, necklace, like the dream experience. Golden ring, like the deep sleep experience. Alright? And then somebody comes and tells you, the reality is not bracelet, necklace, ring. The reality is gold. Where will you look for gold? Uh, there's a, the teacher tells you, gold is not, it's different from the necklace. It's different from the bracelet. It's different from the ring. One. Okay, then I'd start going away to look for it. No, wait. It is in the bracelet, in the ring, in the necklace. In and through the bracelet, ring, necklace. Yet different from them. As far as gold and uh, ornaments are concerned, we all understand what we are talking about. Isn't gold in some sense different from the ornament? No. In one sense it is. Because before it was a bracelet, it was still gold. When you melt it and make it into a ring, is it still gold or not? So the bracelet does not continue. The gold continues. So the gold must be in some sense different from the ornament. It's the material out of which the ornament is made. The gold is different from the ornament. The ornament is a name, a form and a use. What is a bracelet? It's a name. Given to what? Gold. It's a form. Given to what? Gold. It's a use. Given to what? To the golden ornament. So names, forms and uses change. But the material, the substance, what you're paying for, what you weigh, that continues throughout. This is the point to understand in point number three in this example. Gold is available in which ornament? All three. Ah. What continues? Gold. What comes and goes? Ornament. Names, forms, uses. Similarly, Turiya, the real self, the real you, is available in which state? All three states. Which, which of the aspects of the self is the Thurium? All of them. But the Thurium, does it make sense to say Thuria is not the waker, not the dreamer, not the deep sleeper and yet Thuria is in and through waker, dreamer and deep sleeper. Yeah. Right? Gold is not a necklace in itself. Gold is not a bracelet in itself. If it were, it would always be a, always be a bracelet. Gold is not a ring in itself. If it were, it would always be a ring. But... In the bracelet, in the ring, in the necklace, gold is in and through all of them. It gives substance and reality and weight and mass to all of them. In the same way, the consciousness in all these states is none other than Turiyam. Turiyam is different from them. It's not the waker. Why it's not the waker? When you fall asleep and you are the dreamer, the waker is gone. Gone means not in your experience anymore. Yet Turiyam is there. When you go into deep sleep, the waker and the dreamer are gone. There is no Vishwa, there is no Taijasa, it's Pragya. And yet, Turiyam is there. So the waker, dreamer and sleeper, they cycle, they come and go. The waking state, dream state and deep sleep state cycle, it comes and goes. The Turiya is the constant. They are like shadows on the, on the Turiya. They come and go. They are like a play of light and shadow. The only reality in all three is Turiyam. That is point number Five. Four. The first, first, the first point, um, point was uh, the 
re recap. The second point was, it is the knowledge of the fourth aspect which is what we are seeking for, self-knowledge, the one which liberates. Not others, because we have all, we have these, they don't liberate. Self-knowledge means this, knowledge of the fourth. Now, that's why we had to go through this whole thing about one, two, three, four, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, so that we can precisely define what Vedanta means by self-knowledge. And the point number three was the misconception to be corrected. The point number four was that the Turiyam is available, is different from all three, and yet available in and through all of them. That was the fourth point. The fifth point is the example. Fifth point is the necklace, bracelet, ring, gold example, which illustrates all of these things beautifully. Okay. Then... Point number six. Point number five was the example. The gold and ornaments example. You always keep that in mind and try to apply it. Whenever you are confused, you will see. Because if you understand the example well, the gold relationship between gold and the ornaments well, then you can understand this more or less. It will come out quite well. Then point number six is this one. 1, 2, 3 and 4, actually the 3 are appearances and the 4th one alone is real. Again apply the gold and ornaments example. The ornaments are appearances. What's real in them? What do you weigh when you weigh an ornament? Or a goldsmith weighs the ornament? What is he looking for? This bracelet weighs so much, so much. He's not interested in the bracelet. He's interested in the gold constituting the weight, uh, bracelet. So the reality of the ornaments is the gold. The substance of the ornaments is the gold. You can say gold real, ornaments appearances. Of what? Of gold. Turiyam real, waker, dreamer, sleeper, appearances. Of what? Turiyam. How does it appear as waker? With gross name and form. How does it appear as dreamer? With subtle name and form. How does it appear as sleeper? With causal name and form. What is causal name and form? Basically, it's shutting down the, uh, the gross and subtle names and forms. Just switching it off. Potential form. But basically, you can say for symmetry, causal name and form. It is the same Turiyam. Turiyam real. Fourth real. One, two, three, Maya. And this is exactly what Shankara Acharya says when he starts his commentary on the Mandukya Karika. He writes two verses. And in the first verse, the very first thing he says is, the ultimate reality, the ultimate reality is the fourth. But, he says the fourth is counting in Maya. Maya Sankhya Turiyam. Counting one, two, three appearances, we are calling it the fourth. But actually it is the one. It is the one. It is the rope. This is the snake. Suppose some, you are going in the darkness and you see, oh there is a snake there. And somebody else says that, uh, no, 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 it's uh, uh, an old garland thrown away from the temple. Um, and somebody else says, no, 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 there was an earthquake, so it's an old crack on the ground. A crack in the ground, a temple thrown away, by, uh, um, um, a garland thrown away by the temple, or a snake. None of them are real. What is it really? A rope. Three people mistook it in three ways. Now you can say, the fourth one is, uh, is the rope, but the fourth one is actually the only reality. The first three, snake, garland, crack in the earth, are appearances, names and forms. In fact, this is the classic example given in Vedanta. Sarpa, mala, bhujidra. Sarpa means snake, mala means garland, bhujidra means crack on the surface of the earth. All of them are appearances. Of what? Of one rope. All three are appearances, waker, dreamer and sleeper. And the waker's world, and the dreamer's world, and the sleeper's darkness are appearances of one reality. So the fourth one is real, the first three are false. Here itself is implicit the teaching that your samsara is false. Who has samsara? Waker has samsara? You have samsara here you are because you are the waker. And dreamer also has samsara, nightmares, good dreams, bad dreams, samsara. Deep sleeper, you will say deep sleeper has no problem, no samsara, blank, hmm? no problems at all. When you are in deep sleep, any problems? Nothing. 
You don't even have an individual identity there. What to speak of an individual samsara? No. But in deep sleep, the waking universe and the dream universe are merged. The seeds are there. The seeds of samsara are there because you inevitably, what happens? You wake up into your waking world or your dream world. So all three have problems. Samsara is there in implicit form in deep sleep, in an explicit form in waking and dreaming. But Turiya, no waking and dreaming, no samsara, beyond samsara. So this, um, this was the sixth point, that the Turiyam is the real Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. This is Jagat Mithya. Jiva, you are what? Brahma. The fundamental teaching of Vedanta, Brahman alone is real. Turiyam Brahman, same thing. Atman, Turiyam Brahman, same thing. Brahman alone is real. The world is an appearance. And what about me? Where am I? You seem to be here, but you are actually this one. Yes. Guruji, when you say that these three states are false, yeah. and Turiyam is the real, yeah. you call it false because it constantly changes. It changes, it number one, correct. Reason you call it false? One reason is it changes. Another reason is it has no independent existence of its own. It's, the, it's an appearance of the Turiyam. Right? Look at the two examples I've used. It's, it's a, a clever observation. Two examples I've used. One is it's the same gold appearing as ornament, as a necklace, as bracelet, as ring. The same rope appearing to somebody as a snake, as an um, uh, as a old garland, as a crack in the earth. Now you'll see garland, crack in the earth and snake are absolutely false. They're, they have no existence of this. It's just imagined. The moment you see the rope as a rope, they disappear. But on the other hand, the bracelet, if you see the bracelet as gold, does the bracelet disappear? You see the gold and the bracelet form and name and use remains. Right? So which is it? The bracelet, the gold has been shaped into a bracelet. That might be a doubt. Nobody shaped a rope into a snake. It was a, it was an, it was a mistake. So now that shaping the gold into the bracelet or the necklace is not the point here. Forget that. That can lead to confusion. The only point here in the gold and ornament example is whatever the name, form and appearance of the and use of the ornament, the reality is always one and the same gold. Whatever happens in the world, waking, dreaming and deep sleep, the reality is always Turiya. In that sense, in that sense, Turiyam is real and the world is an appearance. Secondarily, of course, it comes and goes. There is a relation. Relation between coming and going and being false. You see, what is false? Which never existed but appeared. What is false? Illusion, falsity. Have you noticed one thing about falsity? Falsity is not something that does not exist. Falsity is something that does not exist but appears. When we say somebody is telling a lie, Somebody is telling the truth and somebody is keeping silent. These three are different things, no? When somebody is telling the lie, the person is speaking. There is something. When somebody is not telling anything, there is silence. There is nothing. When somebody is telling a lie, there is something, but it is not a representation of the truth. So telling a lie is not no speech at all. It is false speech. It appears to be something else. It, it's, it's something else, but appears to be something else. Now, stay with this. I'm showing you the difference between falsity and non-existence and reality. Reality, non-reality. In between is falsity. What is no, um, reality? Turiyam, the absolutely real. What is non-existent? Say, for example, a square circle. It never exists and nobody has ever experienced it. What is falsity? It says, like the snake which appeared on a rope. It doesn't exist there. There is no such snake there. But it appeared, even for a moment. Right? That's falsity. Falsity is telling something or showing something, the reality to be uh, other than what it is. Showing or presenting the reality to be other than what it is. That's the definition of a lie, isn't it? So there must be a reality which appears as other than what it is. That is called falsity. Okay, we have a quick series of questions. I'll come to you. You had a question. Based on this example of the rope, 
Mm. I mean, everyone is Turiya, not a rope. No, yeah. <laughs> the rope is an example. Right. Yeah. So that there is no other, there is everything that we see as different. Yes. It's a falsity. It's falsity. It's an appearance. The difference is an appearance. Oneness is the reality. But Correct. We are all one. Yes. But we don't see that. Uh, see means what sense? We don't feel that. We don't. All right. Let. Let me uh, uh, answer the question. If I have understood it correctly, let me answer the question. Again, apply the bracelet, necklace and ring example and gold example to this. If you tell me these are all one, they are all one thing called gold, then I should be able to see them all as gold. Yeah. And yet after that also it, it appears as a necklace. Necklace appears as a necklace. A bracelet appears as a bracelet. A ring appears as a ring. But... You can see that it's gold. You will say, you will insist. You can see it's gold, right? Yes, with the eye of knowledge. With the physical eyes, what do you continue to see? Necklace as necklace. Bracelet as bracelet. Ring as ring. In the same way, with the physical eyes, you will still see men and women and uh, um, all the 31 genders which New York uh, uh, <laughs> state recognizes. And you will see all the differences. But with the eye of knowledge, of Vedantic knowledge, I and all of these are Turiyam, are the one consciousness in which all of these are appearing. For practical purposes, if you have eyes, you will see forms, various forms. After realization, will you see only one form? Nowhere it's mentioned like that. Turiyam has no form. All forms are appearances. So after enlightenment also, you'll keep seeing the appearances, but you know them to be Turiyam. If you have ears, you will hear sound. After enlightenment, will all the sound merge into one hum? No. You will hear speech and music and everything. So all differences will continue. Just like you see the differences of the, the uh, necklace, ring and uh, bracelet. But you know it to be gold. And it's not a conception. When you know it to be gold, is it a theory? Is it a, some kind of abstraction? Is it philosophy? No, you see, that's the reality. In fact, neck... Necklace, bracelet and ring are um, um, less real than the gold itself. Okay. It's kind of a, a follow-up on that same question. You know, when you give the example of the rope or gold, these, are, these have properties that we identify with. Yes, that's why I'm using them. And in, in the case of consciousness, you know, if, you, if we don't have any properties to... to describe it, yeah. then how do we conceptualize it? You know, it's reality, yeah. but we can't put any properties to it, so how do you conceptualize it? You cannot put, it's a good question, you cannot put any properties to it, you, how do you conceptualize it? The answer is, it has true, it has no properties, and also true, you cannot conceptualize it. In fact, we are going to read now, one of the things we read was, achintyam, beyond conception. <coughs> Then you will say, you look puzzled. You will say, if we cannot conceptualize it at all, then how do we know it? How do we understand it? You are taking it for granted, it has to be known or understood through the mind. It is that which knows and understands the mind or illumines the mind. The mind does not know it. You say, then we are helpless. We are not helpless. Why are we not helpless? Because it's you yourself. If it was something else beyond the mind, X, Y, Z beyond the mind, and I say the mind cannot grasp it, it is forever unknown to you then. But if it is you, it is the one which illumines every act of knowledge of the mind. Without it, no, mind cannot do anything. Right? So, in all these ways, we are helping you to be begin to understand it. But when you understand it finally, really, really understand it, it will be not through the mind. Then th through what? It is very difficult to put it. Sri Ramakrishna put it in this way. Bodhe bodhkara. The self knowing itself. It's not that the waker's mind will suddenly turn inwards and grasp the Turiyam. No. It's a Turiyam which illumines the waker's mind. And the dream. <coughs> and the Turiyam is known in a flash of intuition. There is no way, other way of putting it. If you want to put it in a little more clear way. What we can do with all these exercises is to loosen your identification with the waker and the waking world. 
when you begin to realize I am not the waker and not the waking world, uh, you begin to sense. All these words are wrong. Sense, understand, think. But there is no other word. We can't use it. Language was not meant for this. Language was meant for this. <laughs> right? All of language is for this. Wittgenstein said, the limits of language are the limits of the universe. Very profound statement. That's how he begins his Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. The limits of language are the limits of the universe. It, it, you cannot go beyond, that's why you have to struggle. In fact, one of the words used in the seventh mantra, it is beyond language. We'll see. And yet it can be done, no problem. It's pretty easy also, actually. <laughs> yes. I am the source of the universe. I project hmm. the universe. Yes. But I was not the source when the universe actually took birth. Hmm. So the one who gave rise to the universe, that that entity, and and so one when reaches realization of uh, one's own self, are they the same? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the question you, I've heard your question very deeply. Huh. I, if you, are, you are saying, Swamiji, that I am the source of the universe, but when the universe started, I was not its source, something else gave birth to it. Right. Huh. You're saying that? Yes. Which is the I which you're talking about? This waker? This person? What's your name? Pankaj. Pankaj. You're saying, I, Pankaj, am the source of the universe. But I've never said that. No, I'm saying that Consciousness because ah, okay, stop. Now, step by step. You, consciousness, are the source of the universe. Then what did you say next? When the universe was created, I was not its source. How do you know? When the universe was created, you mean when the universe was created, Pankaj was not there. I was not the source of the universe when the universe was created. Now you are speaking as Pankaj. If you are speaking as Turiyam, if you see it from Turiyam's point of view, Yes. If you see what, what the Upanishad says about Turiyam, if you say I'm speaking as Turiyam, figuratively speaking, because Turiyam doesn't speak, so I'm speaking as Turiyam, then you have, to, you have to take it up fully. See what the Upanishad says. What is Turiyam? Turiyam is that in which the waker and the waker's universe apply, uh, arise. Turiyam is that in which the dreamer and dreamer's universe are experienced. Um, Turiyam is that in which the sleeper and sleep merged universe are experienced. Hmm. The subject and the object, the individual and the totality, they are all experienced in Turiyam. They have no existence apart from the Turiyam. Can I ask follow-up point? I will say, I'll put it again, use the gold and the ornaments example. What you said was, I, as gold, you are saying that I am the source of all the ornaments. Okay? Hmm. Correct? Then you say, but before I was created, the bracelet... How can I say I am the source of um, all the ornaments? You are speaking once as the gold and once as the bracelet. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between God and... So maybe my question is... Mm. That I know what your question is, but you, you, you we sharpen this, it, yes. When we reach this realization, hmm. we become one with God. Ah, mm -hmm. please answer. Now I am going to leave the questions to most of you. Those who have been coming regularly, you can easily answer. What is God in this scheme? Ishwara. Ishwara. Where is God? Here. The consciousness associated with the merged universe in deep sleep. You know what is God in, in this scheme? Who are you in this scheme? Waker, dreamer, deep sleeper? What is God in this scheme? Consciousness associated with the waking universe, otherwise known as Virat. Consciousness associated with the dream universe, all the minds known as Hiranyagarbha. Consciousness associated with the resolved state of the universe or otherwise known as Maya, Ishwara. Consciousness with Maya, Ishwara. Consciousness with subtle, uh, the totality of subtle universe, Hiranyagarbha. Consciousness associated with the totali totality of the physical universe, Virat. That is the idea of God in Vedanta. God is the totality and you are this jiva, are the, are the individual. Then you are interacting with God, I worship God and all of that. 
Here Mandukya is going far beyond God. It might be sacrilegious to talk about that. You might be shocked to hear about it. But it proves what you are saying. That I and God are one. Correct. How? The waker and the waking universe are not one physically. You are here. And the universe is so vast. How can you be one with the universe? So you and God are not one in that sense. But dismiss the waker and the waking universe because they are appearance. Go back to the source, pure consciousness. God is none other than this and you are none other than this. As Turiya, you and God are one. That's what the Upanishad said. I am Atma Brahma. Brahman, Saguna Brahman is the merged universe, dream universe, waking universe. And Turiyam is the reality behind Saguna Brahman. Okay? Ayam Atma Brahma. Ayam Atma means this self is one with Brahman, the cosmic self. How? Forget the individual, forget the cosmic, take the reality behind both. Last question before we start. Yes. We have not started the mantra yet. This is these, we are on the sixth point. Yes. 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 And say here there's three different types of waves. I, I closer to it when I'm going, I'm not the wave, I'm the ocean. Yes. Um, so I, I, that makes me feel a little bit better than maybe some of the other examples because it seems closer. But the, the causation of the wave hmm. itself, I, I'm trying to get, like, um, and does that then, you say the wave is an appearance. But yes. Causation of that appearance is an interesting idea that I don't quite understand. And then, do I reverse that causation, in essence, to, to get rid of the appearance? All right. First of all, if it's an appearance, the causation of the appearance is trivial. Okay. Do you see why? You see that you're saying the causation of the appearance of the snake is interesting. In one sense, it might be interesting in the, in the epistemology of illusion, how it appears. But it's not a real causation because it's not a real snake. If the... A uh, rope produced a real snake, you would be all over it and trying to find out how did that happen. But because it was an error, you're not interested. So that's one thing. But the ocean and wave example is, is a nice uh, way of understanding it. Your question. Wave, ocean, water. What is wave? The individual. What is ocean? God. What is water? Turiya. Which is greater, wave or ocean? Which is greater, wave or ocean? Ocean, ocean? You don't seem confident. <laughs> ocean is greater, definitely. Who is greater, God or individual? God. God, far greater. There's no question about that. You see, never confuse this. We are not saying that individual is God. No, we are not saying that Pankaj or Sarvapriyananda is God. No. That's what the dualists, you know, they accuse us of. Says, what arrogance. You are saying that I am God. You little miserable creature, born and dying the next moment, and you think you are God. But Advaita never says this individual being is God. It dismisses the individuality of the individual, dismisses the cosmicity of God, and finds one absolute behind both of them. That's what Advaita does. Who is greater, ocean or wave? Ocean? Sure. Who is greater, water or ocean? Water. Why? The reason is, Without water, the ocean cannot exist. But the water can exist without the ocean. It can be evaporated, go into a cloud. It can exist in so many ways. Water can take many forms. In fact, the ocean is just the name and form of a mass of water. The wave is just the name and form of a mass of water. The wave and the ocean are one as water. And remember, when I say ocean and wave, a little illusion, a little problem might be created because the ocean has lots more water than any wave. So you might think, okay, I'm a wave. So I have, a li- I have water, but a little less water, and ocean has lots more water. But in the example fails at that point. When you come to consciousness, akhandam, there is no more consciousness or less consciousness. There is just one shining reality, which through maya can appear as the cosmic being called God, which through an individual name and form can appear as the waker, individual waker, dreamer, sleeper. Stop. Okay. Now we go to, we still have not finished the seventh and eighth points. Easily done. 7th and 8th points are very important, but easily done. We are segueing into the mantra. The 7th point is, notice this. It's a feature of our experience that we experience the world as um, 
subject and object. Pairs of knower and known. Pramata, Prameya. Right? In all the three states. Now, of these pairs, these two are called the effect. Karyam. The waker and waking universe, dreamer and dream universe. And this is called the cause. Deep sleeper and the sleep universe. If you look at it from God's point of view, that's why all religions call God the cause of the universe. That from which the universe emerges, that in which the universe exists, that into which the universe disappears. What is that? Not Turiyam. It's God. Right? So, causal state is God. And the effect state is the universe. And in each state you find waker, uh, the knower and the known. The knower and the known. The turiyam is apart from the knower and the known in each state. And yet in and through the knower and the known. We have, we have touched upon this earlier. So the turiyam, tran now I am using two words, transcendent, immanent. The turiyam transcends the waker and the waking universe like gold transcends the bracelet huh? no yes. turium transcends means it can exist beyond so turium transcends the dreamer and the dream universe why only turium you the waker transcend the dreamer and the dream universe you wake up into the waking world so the turium transcends the dreamer and the dream universe and the turium transcends the sleeper and the merged universe the Turiyam is a transcendent reality. The Turiyam is a transcendent reality. And the Turiyam is also an immanent reality. The Turiyam is also an immanent reality. It is in and through this. Immanent means existing within. Again, take the gold example. Does the gold transcend the ornaments? When you melt down the bracelet, is gold destroyed? Is bracelet destroyed? Yes. yes. So bracelet goes away. Gold stays. Necklace comes. Gold stays. Necklace goes away. Melted. Gold stays. Ring is formed. Gold is there. Now gold transcends the ornaments. But is also in and through the ornaments. What do you touch when you touch the necklace? Gold. What do you touch when you touch the bracelet? Gold. What do you weigh when you weigh the ring? You're weighing gold. You're not weighing a ring. You're weighing gold. Similarly, so gold is immanent. immanent. Now this is a very interesting thing. Gold is beyond the ornaments and yet in and through the ornaments. In technical philosophical term, gold is transcendent to the ornaments yet immanent in the ornaments. Turiyam is transcendent to the, to the other three states, other three aspects, waking, dreaming, deep sleep and yet immanent in the Three aspects. In and through them. Okay? Turiyam transcends what? Not only the waker, dreamer and sleeper. But transcends the waking universe, dream universe and merged universe. Turiyam is not. It's important to note. Turiyam is not the waker. Turiyam is not the dreamer. Turiyam is not the deep sleeper. Turiyam is not the universe which you see. So basically to put it this way, Turiyam is neither the knower nor the known. But it's still transcendent and immanent of those two. And immanent. Transcendent means neither the knower nor the known. Transcendent means that. Turiyam is not the knower. Turiyam is not something to be known also. Neither the known nor the knower. It seems to be nothing. And yet it is the reality out of which the knower and the known are constituted. It is in and through all of that. You apply, it sounds very mysterious. Apply the gold and ornament example, it will be as clear as day. Gold is not an ornament and yet all ornaments, golden ornaments are nothing but gold. Right. So the point I wanted to make here was Turiyam transcends Pramata Prameya, knower and known and yet is immanent to knower and known. Eighth point before we start the mantra is this mantra itself can be divided on this basis, can be divided into three parts. The mantra itself can be divided into three parts, which we will study now. 
the first part of the mantra, the first part of the mantra denies that Turiyam is the waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. We, have, we want to know who the reality is, the real fourth aspect. So the first part of the mantra says the fourth aspect, Turiyam, is not the waker, Vishwa, is not the dreamer, Taijasa, is not the deep sleeper, Pragya. First part denies that. Second part, it denies, second part of the mantra denies that Turiyam is any of the known things in this universe. It's not what you, Turiyam is not what you can know. Not, a, not something you can see, not something you can hear, not something you can smell, touch, taste. It's not something that can be revealed by speech. It's not something that you can think about. It's not something that you can infer. Uh, so that's the second part of the mantra, which denies Turiyam is Prameyam, knowable. First part, Pramata, no. Second part, Prameyam, knowable, no. So this is the transcendent aspect of the Turiyam. It's beyond all of this. The third part of the mantra, concluding part is, yet Turiyam is the reality of all of this. It is in and through all of that. There is Adhishthanam. Adhishthanam is the ground of reality. Immanent. Turiyam is, so the first two parts of the, this mantra we will see. The first two parts are like this. Seventh mantra if you come to. From Nanta Pragyam to Na Pragyam is the first part of the mantra. Which denies what? Turiyam is not the waker, not the dreamer, not the sleeper. And then, or any other intermediate stage of awareness. Because once in a while questions came. Aren't there other states also? You know, samadhi, coma, uh, or uh, some trance, some vision, or simply in between sleeping and dreaming, transitional states. It will say that none of those. Turiyam is none of them. So it's none of these. That's the first part. From na, Nanta Pragyam up to Na Pragyam. Then from the next line, Adrishtam. You see, Adrishtam Abhyavaharyam. From Adrishtam up to um, Abhyapadeshyam. That long phrase is the second part of the mantra which denies that Turiyam is Prameyam, knowable. Turiyam is not a knowable. These the three states are divided into knower and knowable. Turiyam is not a knower, is not a knowable. And the last part, which is the most uh, powerful part, uh, Ekatma Pratyaya Saram onwards up to Saatma Savigyaya, the third part, it shows you Turiyam is immanent in all of this, is quite apart from that, them and yet in and through all of them, immanent in Sanskrit, Adhishthanam. Pramata Prameya Vyatiriktam in Sanskrit. Pramata Prameya Vetiriktam, other than the knower and the known. Pramata Prameya Adhishthanam. Or in another way, Pramata Traya Vetiriktam, other than the three knowers. Three knowers means three aspects of the self waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. Other than the three knowable universes, Prameya Traya Vetiriktam. Waking universe, dream universe, merge universe. Other than all of them. And yet, Pramata Prameya Traya Adhishthanam. The ground of all knowers and knowables. Good. Now we are actually really set to understand the mantra and we can do it pretty fast. The mantra goes like this. So we have to memorize it, you know. Nanta pragyam na vahish pragyam na vahayata pragyam na pragyana ghanam na pragyam na pragyam adrishtam abhyavaharyam agrahyam alakshanam achintyam abhyapadeshyam ekatma pratyasaram prapanchopashamam shivam shantam advaitam chaturtham manyante sa atma sa vigyenyaha. This is Turiyam. So now let's take it up one by one. Now you know what to expect. What is Turiyam? What is the fourth aspect of the self? Chaturshpada. Chaturthapada. What is Turiyam? First, Na Antapragyam. It is not the dreamer. Antapragyam, dreamer, where consciousness is turned inwards. It's the word used in the fifth mantra, Antapragyam, the dreamer. Na Bahishpragyam, consciousness turned outwards through the senses. That means not the waker. Na Ubhayata Pragyam. 
not any intermediary state of awareness. This sometimes, many times people ask this question, why only waking, dreaming and deep sleep? Why not a transitional state? Why not samadhi? Why not mystical states which, which mystics Ramakrishna sees, Ma Kali? So why not that? None of them, them are Turiyam. So as an aside, so you'll say then, say, was Ramakrishna deluded? Did Ramakrishna not realize Turiyam? Remember, when Ramakrishna sees Kali, what is Kali? It is Turiyam alone with the name and form of Kali. What are you seeing here? It is Turiyam alone with the name and form of Vedanta society. So, yes, Ramakrishna did see Turiyam, but when the question of seeing something comes, name and form are already there. It might be a worldly name and form like ours, or it might be a divine name and form which exceptional mystics have experiences. But what they are saying is something beyond worldliness and mysticism here. This Vedantic knowledge is, is, is the, literally the absolute, that which appears in all these forms. So, one extreme Vedantist can be shocking. You ask, but what, Swami, are you saying that Ramakrishna did not see God, did not see, ah, be careful, what are you saying, seeing God? Yes, he can see God. But did he not see Turiyam? Did you say see? If you see, then there's no Turiyam. <laughs> Whatever you have seen, <laughs> seen is not, it's Turiyam. if it's seen, it is Turiyam plus name and form. Through the filter of a name and form, from a perspective. Yes. Hearing is maya, smelling, touching, all of it is maya. Thinking is maya. Ah. All of that. Okay. Can you say all of this we are doing is maya or not? Yeah, that was the question. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. This is also maya. So then, well then what? Maya has two, two aspects. Vidya maya, avidya maya. Avidya maya is that which traps you in samsara. Vidya maya is that which releases you from samsara. Sri Ramakrishna himself said, it is the Divine Mother alone who engages us in this play of samsara. And if you really want liberation, it is the Divine Mother alone who will give you liberation. Brahman, Turiyam will not give you liberation. Turiyam is totally useless. <laughs> it does not trap you in samsara. It does not give you liberation also. <laughs> right, now, right now, Turiyam is completely present. Right now. Is it helping you? No. It is trapping you in samsara. It helps you through... Vidya Maya, which is Vedanta society. So, here you are. No Bhayata Pragyam. Ubhayata means dual. No intermediate stage. No extraordinary stage. Na Pragyana Ghanam. What is Pragyana Ghanam? It is the term used for deep sleeper. You are not the sleeper also. Turiyam is not the sleeper. Na Pragyam. Here the word Pragyam means the awareness of... No, Pragyam, not Pragyam. Pragyam means no, no, the awareness, the, the knowledge of Ishwara, of God, the all-knowing, omniscient. So is it an omniscient awareness? Not that also. That's the awareness of Ishwara. Turiya is not Ishwara. I mean, ultimately. So na Pragyam. It is not the awareness or omniscient awareness of Ishwara. That's why I said it's a bad translation. Then somebody will say, oh... It is not waking awareness, it's not dream awareness, it's not deep sleep, it's not intermediary state, it's not the all-knowing awareness of God. It must be a stock and a stone or a piece of chalk or something, you know, like no awareness. In that, in that case, Turiyam means no awareness at all. Is that what you mean? He said, na apragyam, not no awareness either. Yeah. Shunyam. shunyam. Do you think it's Shunyam? Not Shunyam either. If you say gold, same example. Gold is not the bracelet. Oh, it must be the ring. It's not the ring. It must be the, uh, the uh, necklace. It's not the necklace. So gold is nothing. Not nothing. It is all in fact. It's the only reality. Yeah. Ishwara is like necklace, ring and bracelet all together. The whole jewelry set. That must be uh, the gold. No, not even that. You are misunderstood. That is the transcendent aspect of gold. It is true that gold is there in all of them. But first, the transcendent aspect of God, gold. So none of the knowers are what in whatever way you conceive knowing. None of it is Turiyam. This is the neti neti phase. Not this, not this. First, not this is, it's not the knower. The second, not this will be, it's not the knowable also. Nothing that you can know. So it's not me, but it's this, no. Let's take it up. The second stage. Adrishtam. Adrishtam means invisible. Invisible to what? Invisible to your eyes. You can't see it. Invisible. And as I said, 
all the mystics who saw God as Krishna or Christ or Kali, they saw the Turiyam but with a name and a form. We are seeing Turiyam with worldly names and forms. They saw Turiyam with a divine name and form. That's the difference. And it's a big difference, no doubt. Um, Adrishtam. You can't see it, smell it, touch it, taste it. Hear it. I heard the voice of God. Mystics say, I heard the voice of God. Yes, that's the voice of God. It's not Turiyam. That's still not the absolute truth. You are an individual experiencing either a delusion or actually you may one of be those rare prophets too who have actually mystically experienced the voice of God. But even that is way below what we are discussing here. Now, Adrishtam. Next it says, Abhyavaharyam, but before that we will do Agrahyam. Before Ab- Abhyavaharyam, Agrahyam. Agrahyam means ungraspable. Ungraspable by what? By motor organs. Sense organs cannot grasp it. Motor organs. Okay. Can I go to Turiyam? If I go on a pilgrimage to Banaras or uh, Vrindavan or Mecca or Jerusalem, can I go to Turiyam? Or Vedanta Society? Can I go to Turiyam? No. You can't walk to Turiyam. Can I hold... You know, hold on to the feet of the Lord, we say. In, in Bhakti tradition, hold on to the feet of the Lord. So can I hold on to the Turiyam? No feet for you to hold on to. You cannot hold on. Hands cannot grasp it. Feet cannot walk to it. Uh, so the motor organs cannot grasp Turiyam. Sense organs cannot grasp Turiyam. Motor organs cannot grasp Turiyam. Abhyavaharyam. No transaction is possible. You cannot use Turiyam for anything. I can pray to God and God will fulfill my desires. Can I pray to Turiyam? Turiyam sounds like a pretty nifty guy. Can I pray to Turiyam to fulfill my desires? Nothing. You won't get a thing out of Turiyam. Completely unconcerned. If you want to pray, remember who prays? The individual prays. The waker. Or maybe the dreamer. The individual knower prays to to the totality. Individual jiva prays to God. Jiva prays to Ishwar. Individual prays to God. So you pray to God. But the individual and God are none other than the Turiyam. From Turiyam's perspective, there is nobody to pray, nobody to pray to and nothing to pray for. Yeah. You are the reality of everything. What will you pray for? You are a, once you realize your Turiyam, you know nothing in the universe is apart from you. The story of the princess of Kashi. By the way, I saw on YouTube, yes. yeah. somebody has <laughs> yeah, to the, to, yeah. taken the story of the Princess of Kashi and put classical music in the background. and <laughs> So they're doing all sorts of things. By the way, the Buddha had the bad gap. And bad gap Buddha had the gas pump interview is now online, I saw today. So you can check it out. It's interesting. It was a two-hour interview. Supposed to be for one hour, went on for two hours. Uh, Buddha had the gas pump. <laughs> So they interview, it's Rick Archer, he interviews, uh, earlier it was spiritually awakened people. So that rules me out. But then, then he relaxed the standards to spiritually awakening people. And said, okay, I can live with that. Everybody's spiritually awakening anyway. So. And so he interviews people. They've interviewed many spiritual teachers. I think large, you'll, see, you'll see on the website. So they emailed and said, we want to interview you. We did that interview a couple of weeks ago. So one hour, it stretched to two hours. Try, look at it in the YouTube channel. Yeah. <coughs> Buddha at the gas pump. <laughs> or you just say bad gap. B-A-T-G-A-P. <laughs> bad gap. It's pretty uh, well known actually. Um, agrahyam. You, uh, uh, avyavaharyam. No transaction can be done. Vyavahara means transaction. Use. Can I use Turiyam? Can I use Turiyam to defeat my enemies? No way. Your enemies are also Turiyam. <laughs> Can I use Turiyam to play the stock market? No way. Win or lose, it's the same Turiyam. <laughs> so, Abhyavaharyam. That's why one of my teachers used to say, Turiyam is the most useless. Literally, Abhyavaharyam means useless. So, it, there's no use. But you, remember, use is always in ignorance. All usage is in ignorance. Abhyavaharyam. Then it says, next one. Adrishtam Abhyavaharyam Agrahyam. Alakshanam. What did it, what did it say? 
it says alakshanam it is uninferable inference inference you can't see it but you infer it most of science is inference you do an experiment you get the data and from that you infer you know some understanding right so sometimes because of the movement some some planets another planet was detected you infer it you can't see it but you infer it most of medicine when the doctor looks at your pathology uh, report the doctor infers on the basis of that data this uh, say the liver or the heart is malfunctioning the doctor is not directly seeing it malfunctioning on the basis of data inference often it's on the very deep scientific experiments are often on the basis of masses of statistical data so you infer something uh, the classic example they give in vedanta or in indian philosophy is uh, parvato vanniman dhumat there is fire on the mountain top because i see smoke the fire engine start you know when you see smoke because smoke indicates fire you have not seen the fire yet but by the presence of smoke you infer fire because you have established a link between smoke and fire inferential coupling there is no inferential coupling possible in fact lakshanam means inferential coupling that's the exact meaning of lakshanam no inferential coupling possible for thurium you can't see anything and then infer thurium so alakshanam then can you think about it in some way conceive of it achintyam that which is not a subject or not an object to any sense organ any motor organ that which you cannot infer or deduce in any way you can't think about it also it's beyond thought achintyam can you at least use language to designate it can you use language to designate it avyapadeshyam the next word vyapadesha means naming it cannot be named why can it not be named i mentioned this earlier but in the at the beginning of this mantra the <coughs> introductory uh, bhashyam commentary written by shankara acharya he gives you the reasons why language cannot be used to describe turiyam why not after all you are using the word turiyam atma brahma so why why are you saying that language cannot be used i have mentioned earlier shankara acharya says that um, um how does language function language requires five things to function five things to function any one of these five is enough for language to function what are they uh, jati guna kriya sambandha rudhi what are they class or species category shankaracharya says you identify this animal as a cow because you are aware of the class characteristics of the animals called cows the species characteristics you identify it won't work for turiyam or brahman because there is no class of brahmans there is only one reality is one non dual reality so there is no class characteristic <laughs> not even a super class god is like a super class but this is beyond any class so it won't work guna quality the yellow flower the red flower you using the quality uh, the the um decaf or caffeinated you're using the quality some property but brahman is nirgunam no quality so you cannot you cannot use a property or quality to designate brahman then kriya function call the driver of that vehicle is blocking my my exit how are you designating that person among so many persons driver activity brahman is no activity laziest of all things nishkriyam actionless so no activity cannot be used to designate brahman then relation for example use use sometimes guru teacher father a father is a father only because he has got sons or daughters with relation to something he becomes a father or a teacher um relation always requires two or more terms but brahman is non dual with what will it have a relationship so relation is also not possible the final possibility of using language is called convention or rudi normally how you use language i say that person is called jack 
Why? Is it a class? Is it a quality? Is it an action? Is it a relationship? No, no, none of them. We just name this person Jack. So can't we name it Brahman, Atman, Turiyam? No, that will also not work. Why? Because designation naming requires pointing out. If I say that person is Jack, what will your question be? Which person? Unless I point out that person, it won't work. You will not learn anything new. So in the same way, yes. Well, then, uh, what is the question you're talking about when he says uh, about the uh, string of, that links all of the pearls together? Uh, isn't Turiya the string that links all of these pearls? Yes, together? that is true. It, that means it is immanent in all of them. Immanent in all of them. String that links. But what about the name? How will you give a name unless you point it out? But Turiyam, you cannot point it out. You can't see it, smell it, touch it. You can't think about it, conceive of it. How are you going to point it out? Point out. If I say, if I say Jack, I, to, I can point out Jack. <coughs> but if I say Turiyam, where? Nobody can point it out to you. So that will also not work. The conventional designation. Rudi means conventional designation. The five ways of using language. Class, quality, action, relationship, conventional designation. None of them work for Turiyam or Brahman. Hence, unnameable, beyond language. Every day in the evening we sing. Just now at 6.30 we will sing. Namo Namo Prabhu Vakya Manatita. Salutations to you Lord who are beyond mind and speech. This is the philosophy behind it, what I am just saying now. So, Abhyapadeshyam. That is the second part of the mantra which denies that it is a knowable. So, neither known, knower nor known. Neither knower nor knowable. Not Pramata, not Prameya. Transcendent. This is called transcendent aspect of Turiya. Now we have, yeah, I'll come to you. So we don't have time to com complete the last part, which is the immanent aspect. Like you said, the st string that connects all pearls. The reality that runs through everything, giving everything reality and light. So that one we will see next time. Um, okay, that's enough for today. Question? Yes, does Turiya have a purpose in the sense that my question is sort of fundamental, and, huh. and I apologize because everybody might understand this, but why? Why does, why can't consciousness just be, instead of creating a projecting mind? Ah, so world? that's your question. Does Turiya have a purpose in creating and projecting all of this? Remember uh, the last uh, class? It was snowy. I didn't oh, <laughs> you should catch up. That was the question that was debated in the last oh. class. In the Karikas of Gaudapada, he says, why does this one have to appear in all these ways? And he considers so many theories. I think half a dozen theories were considered. Until he came to the final, his own conclusion. He even considers the Maya theory of Advaita. And he goes a step beyond that. He says, as you said, it is true that Turiyam just is. And these appearances are part of being just is of Turiyam. There is no reason behind it. There is no cause behind it. Why there is no cause behind it? Why can you not ask why? Do you remember we had a long talk about this? Yeah. What's wrong with asking why? To put it precisely, you think about it later and catch up on the recording. Why is it uh, wrong to ask why? Vivekananda says this question, what you asked. This question itself is wrong. Why is this question wrong if you ask? Then there will be what we discussed last time. What are you asking when you ask why? When you ask why, what sort of answer will satisfy you? You are asking for a cause. Like you say, why is the ground wet? Because the snow melted. Why did the snow melt? Because the sun shone. Like that. So you are you asking why you need an answer which is a cause. But cause will work only in causation, which is here. What is cause here? The deep sleep state. This one is causal state. What is effect? This universe. But this is beyond cause and effect. This is beyond causation. Do you remember the discussion of Maya we had? Maya is time, space and causation. Right? If you say beyond Maya, if you say, it's like saying beyond time. And if you ask a question that um, uh, when did time be begin? You can't ask that question because when is a time question. Only when you accept time, then you can ask when, before, after. But before time began, meaningless question, because before and after accept time. 
What is outside space if you ask? Meaningless question because outside and inside are space questions. Similarly, why causation is a meaningless question because why is a question that is useful only when causation is accepted. So beyond Maya, if you're asking, this is within causation. This is the cause, these are the effects. But beyond causation, you can't ask why. Okay, one more question was there here. Yes. You know, uh, when, when you said that uh, the, uh, you cannot describe you know, uh, consciousness, like we have the uh, descriptions for gold or rope. Hmm. So each one of us, you know, if, if just because we are thinking about it, so that's in the waking state. Yes. So each one of us will have a different conception of consciousness. Sure. And that's, that's okay. Right? No, it's not. Because we have different conceptions, that's why we think of ourselves as somewhere here. What it is trying to do is, look what it did. It denied all conceptions right now. So you need to step out of all consciousness into re all, all conceptions into the non-conceptual reality. Why is that possible? Because you are the non-conceptual reality. You'll see it is possible. In fact, the next thing which will happen, the practice with the help of Om, will help you to understand this. That's the whole purpose of that Om practice. So different again conceptions are useful, but what? this mantra is doing, the first part of the mantra and the second part of the mantra is deconstructing all conceptions. Whatever you can conceive of is either a knower or a known and it denies that Turiyam is any of them. You drop that. We will see. We'll, we'll try a little exercise now. We'll see. And see where it leads us. Okay. Last question then. Yes. So we are, we are in the waking stage and the dreamer and these states. Hmm. changes or whatever the experiences we have. Hmm. And the whole exercise is to try to know that Thurium is the basis. Basis, the and changeless basis. Changeless hmm. basis and that knowing that hmm. or realizing that would then allow us to experience these states in a less of a suffering. Correct. It loosens the whole. In fact, in Shankaracharya's own language, Shitili Karoti, it loosens the bond of samsara. The very first effect will be it loosens its grasp on you. Yeah. But you said none, we can't know this. You, can, you cannot know it as this. Waker knows the way, no, knower knows the known. You cannot know it like that. So then how? We'll see how. We are, we are seeing, we are, on, we are in the process. <laughs> you, do, you do not know it as an object, but you are, you are it. You are, it. You are that. That you know yourself. What will happen is, when you say I, when you say I, right now it refers to this. What Mandukya Upanishad and Mandukya Karika and Vedanta are doing is, it makes you shift this I to that. This I, you will say it in the mind only. But what does it mean? When I say pen, when I say pen, it means this. When I say I, what does it mean? Normally it means this. And there all suffering starts. Normally it means this. It will shift. First it gives you, sets up this idea of Turiyam in your mind. Pushes your reference of the eye back to that. Then from that perspective you see the whole panorama. Nisargadatta said, to a jnani all is entertainment. <laughs> Health is entertainment. Being sick and dying of cancer in Mount Sinai is entertainment. Uh, all Really, all of that will be entertainment. Because all of that are here. When you look back, it's for example right now, when you look back from this perspective on your dream world, isn't it entertainment? Mm -hmm. Exactly like that, your attitude will be to everything in this universe. That's really cool. It's cool, yes. <laughs> That's why we are, we are attempting all of this. All right, let's stop here. We'll pick it up next time again. A little exercise. Now you'll, it'll all begin to make sense. Please sit relaxed. Stretch a little if you want, you're feeling stiff. <clears throat> this world which you are seeing is your waking world. See it properly. This is the last time you're going to see it. <laughs> this is the waking world. This is the waking knower, this body, this person. 
establish yourself nicely in it. Waker and the Waker's universe. Close your eyes. Drop the Waker and the Waker's universe. You do not see anything. For the time being, just listen to me. But otherwise, don't. you're not hearing anything, smelling anything, tasting anything, touching anything. And no external awareness. World disappears from you. Except the faint sense of the body. Just imagine that there's nothing else outside that. No world, no houses, cars or parking, no relatives or no mortgage or no... No job, no body to take care of also. Thoughts, memories, desires. This is your dream universe. The subtle aspect of the self. Drop that. You dive into a deep nothingness. Blank. No thoughts. If any thoughts arise, drop them immediately. Your only reaction should be to calmly drop them. No memories. Don't even remember what your name is. No happiness, no misery, no feelings. The blankness, that is the causal state, deep sleep state. Absolute blank. Now, drop that blankness. When you are comfortable, you can open your eyes. It's not supposed to be done that fast. It should be done over a period of 20 to 30 minutes at least. But the point is this. We are aware of sensations. See, hear, smell, touch, heat and light, cold. Drop that and retreat into the world of thoughts, ideas, memories. Stop that, retreat into the world of Complete silence and stillness. Drop that also. Language cannot take you any further. But you are still there. That one, the beauty is, it's present now also. When you are awake, looking at me, going to go about your business of life, you are that one. Imagine the tremendous peace and joy and freedom of that one. That you are. I am Atma Brahma. That's what we read. This very self is that consciousness, the Turiyam. All right, we shall do the third part of this seventh mantra, the immanent. By the way, Swami Vivekananda, in his light, lucid way, he explains Vedanta, he says, the Hindus worship a transcendent, immanent God. No explanation, just leaves it at that. This whole class and the next one will be an explanation of that little statement. The Hindus worship a transcendent, immanent God. Very interesting. 
a lot of philosophy behind it. If you emphasize, if you overemphasize the transcendence, you end up with the problems that the Abrahamic religions have. Lord is beyond everything. That's why in Christianity you see there is an, an aspect of immanence, but the connection between immanence and transcendence is very problematic. In Islam, it leads to violence. If anybody tries to say somehow God is present in anything, that's wrong. And yet, if God is completely transcendent, then we have no way of con contacting this God, knowing or contacting or experiencing this God. On the other hand, if you overstress immanence, that God is, is all this, it will lead to pantheism, that this is God. God this, if this is God, tables and chairs are God as, it, as such. It does you no good. Then why call it God? Just call it the universe. Spinoza's pantheism. Spinoza says this universe is God. Of course, that's an injustice to Spinoza. If you read Spinoza carefully, he is actually speaking about transcendent humanity. In fact, if you go to the depth of all the religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and of course Vedanta, if you see what they're trying to say with this perspective, you will see that they're all speaking about this, a transcendent immanent God. Only the philosophical structure is not there to express it. In Sufism, for example, they are speaking about this only. But it's a mystical, poetical approach. But they don't have the philosophical structure, the clean, logical step-by-step step to take you there. So, at the heart of everything, there's a book, David Bentley Hart, The Experience of God, Knowing, Being and Bliss, Satchidananda. He is a Christian theologian, Eastern Orthodox Church. The Experience of God, David Bentley Hart. And the names of the chapters are Sat Chit Ananda. And he says, I've taken it from the Vedanta of India. But he says, basically this is the conclusion of all the great uh, religious traditions of humanity. It's just expressed so powerfully and clearly. In other traditions, it has been marginalized. It has been pushed to the margin, or sometimes persecuted, sometimes ignored. But now it's being rediscovered everywhere. In Hinduism, it has been mainstream. Nobody uh, marginalized it. Or, you know. yeah. Next time.